I'm a wild animal, rawr, but I'm a relaxed wild animal. Hopefully I got your attention, but it's not completely irrelevant. Okay, so when you look at research and you find kind of in the animal world, in a survival state, if you were relaxed, you wouldn't survive, right? If you weren't eating, if you were stressed out, you would hope that you would be stressed out enough to be able to go find food, not relaxed and complacent with the fact that you're starving, right? Well, a lot of that has to do with the research I'm going to talk about today. Now, I wanna cover the mistakes that people make during prolonged fasting. And by prolonged fasting, I'm going to go ahead and say anything over 24 hours for the sake of this video. So let's go ahead and let's jump right in. I don't wanna waste any time. The first one is going to be very relevant to what I just said, and that is doing a 24 to 48 or plus hour fast when you are already stressed out. Okay, blanket statement, but let's dive into the research a little bit. The European Journal of Clinical Nutrition took a look at two very important things related to stress. Cortisol levels, which you're probably somewhat familiar with, and heart rate variability, which I'll explain in just a little bit. Okay, now if you look at the chart that's on the screen right now, you'll see that it's pretty normal to have like an increase in cortisol in the morning. This is normal, it gets our blood pressure up, gets our natural stress response going. But if you look during a 48 hour fast, on the second day, you have this increase of cortisol that ends up going up to about 80% more than day one, showing that when we are fasting, we have an increase in cortisol. Okay, duh, no brainer, right? We're stressed out. Then you look at the other chart that's popping up now, you'll see it continues to go up the longer the fast. So we have this morning spike, and the morning spike baseline is higher and higher each day until cortisol is just climbing up. Eventually it does peak, and that's in longer fasts, but we'll talk about that in a different video, realistically. Why does this matter? Because if you are combining the stress of a prolonged fast with already existing stress of your life, you reach a tipping point. Fasting should be a stressor or hormetic stressor in which you are trying to instill a tiny bit of stress so you force an adaptation. But the hormetic curve is just that, it's a curve and eventually you go too far and you actually damage yourself. But as far as body composition goes, there's huge negative aspects of fasting when you're stressed out. Okay, sure it does become easier in terms of your eating habits, but visceral fat, which is the belly fat, the fat that's underneath our, like in our organs that is really not good that we hear about, that's the stuff that gives you a pot belly that we really gotta get rid of. Okay, well you prohibit your body from being able to really burn that visceral fat if you are super, super stressed and cortisol levels are very high. See, the visceral fat within our gut has a lot of what are called glucocorticoid receptors. That means it has cortisol receptors. So when cortisol levels are high, they flock to the visceral fat. Now, what does that do in terms of fat? Well, cortisol and glucocorticoids and visceral fat, it's very adipogenic. What that means is when cortisol binds to these glucocorticoid receptors, it triggers fat cells to accumulate more. Now, you're not gonna accumulate fat cells while you are fasting, but what you will do is not activate them and not burn them. So therefore, you start burning fat from other areas of your body but not where you probably want to burn it the most, in the belly fat or in the visceral fat region. So you do need to be paying close attention to this. So you need to look at, okay, when am I not stressed out? Because I know it seems like fasting should be something you implement all the time, like whenever, but you really do have to keep a close watchful eye on your stress levels. When you're worried about getting fired and you have a lot of stress and you're fighting with your spouse or your loved one, maybe it's not the time to fast, even though it seems like the most logical time because it would make everything else easier. Think about it. And then we factor in some data that you could look at using what is called heart rate variability. This is really new stuff. Stuff, and I find it fascinating. So heart rate variability is not something that like is only for super biohackers. Okay, heart rate variability measures the intervals between your heartbeats. Okay, now there's a lot of different things out there like the Aura Ring, like Whoop and everything. I'm not you know in cahoots with any of those brands. I'm just saying those are things that people use to measure them. So you're measuring the intervals between your beats. Now, the less of an interval between the beats, like the shorter the time period between the beats as can be looked at on these different apps and stuff, that's going to indicate that you are in more of what is called a sympathetic system, sympathetic nervous system response. That means you're stressed out, so your heart's beating fast and kind of like cattywampus, right? A higher HRV means your heart is relaxed and that indicates that you're recovered and not as stressed out. So when you look at the data, you see that a lower HRV is going to mess up your fast because a fast is going to lower your HRV as well. Again, a normal response. So what you need to do if you're utilizing HRV is look at your baseline for the last few days and notice the first day that you have an upward tick in your HRV showing an improvement in your HRV, the next day you should start your prolonged fast. Okay, because usually if you start to see downward movement or upward movement in this case, you're going to have more upward movement the next day. 
Now, additionally, what's probably more important is look at your heart rate variability during a fast and compare it to another fast and see how you're getting more adapted. Like, hear me out on this. Okay, let's say you just did your first 24 hour fast today. Okay, and that 24 hour fast led to a pretty significant decrease in your heart rate variability, a worse heart rate variability. Well, flash forward a year later, doing that same fast after fa practicing fasting for a year, you're gonna find your HRV probably doesn't move that much because you've become adapted and your sympathetic nervous system is not as shocked about a fast, right? So you need to look at that data to see, okay, well, well if I'm getting adapted to a fast, then and only then could I apply trying to fast during a stressful period of time or trying super intense exercise during a longer fast. You get what I'm saying there? Anyway, based upon that, let's move into mistake number two, which is exercising right smack dab in the middle of a prolonged fast. Okay, not at the beginning and not at the end. If you work out at the beginning of a fast, your cortisol levels aren't super high to begin with. You haven't been fasting that long, so you're okay to work out. Sure, your cortisol levels will go up afterwards, but that's kind of par for the course anyway. You're not embarking on your workout in a totally like cortisol elevated state. Now, on the contrary, if you work out at the end of a fast, you might be thinking, uh, Thomas, you're an idiot. Like my cortisol levels are going to be through the roof. Why would I want to work out then? Well, you can get away with working out at the end of your fast because you know that at the end of your workout, you're going to be bringing your cortisol levels down by eating, right? You're gonna eat after your workout because it's at the end of a fast, which would imply, oh, I get to bring my cortisol levels down. Any spike in insulin when you eat food is gonna bring cortisol down for a little bit. So you're fine there, okay? And studies have indicated that if you eat after a workout, it improves your HRV, your heart rate variability. So what happens if you work out in the middle of a fast? Well, in the middle of a fast, you are surrounded with high levels of cortisol on each side. High levels of cortisol before your workout, high levels of cortisol afterwards. In the middle is this workout sandwich right there where you're just messing your body up more. Now, again, if you are adapted, this is a different story. But if you're getting started on prolonged fasting, it's one of the hardest things that you could probably ask of your body. It's going to really send you into a shock state, which leads me right into mistake number three, not getting protein after your fast. This is one of the cardinal rules of prolonged fasting. You need to break your fast with protein. And I don't care if you're vegan, vegetarian, carnivore, keto, paleo, whatever. Protein should be the break fast meal. You need to stop the muscle catabolism. You need to kickstart the anabolic processes to really tell your body, hey, you are out of a fast. Some people say eat fat so it continues your fast. That's a very specific method. Do not eat a bunch of carbs right after your fast if you're a beginner either. Protein is how you break it. Either lean protein like chicken, lean fish, or if you wanna make it easy, use like some kind of plant-based protein powder that's easy for your body to break down. I put a link for the one that I use, which is called Sun Warrior. There's a link as well, and you can use the code and you get 15% off. Sun Warrior is a hemp and pea protein blend, which I find just works really well on my stomach, and I also feel like I utilize the protein really well. So that is definitely going to be a recommended route to go, especially if you can't have some like lean, like lean chicken or something like that that's rich in thiamine. So again, big thanks to Sun Warrior for the continued support on this channel as well. And that link is down below for 15% off. This next one is really interesting. So please hear me out on this one. Using prolonged fasting as your first lifestyle intervention can be a tremendous mistake. And what I mean by that is, saying, oh, I wanna lose weight, so I'm gonna embark on a 24 hour fast or 48 hour fast. Please, please build yourself up to that. And it's not just because it's a dangerous thing, it's because you're going to set the pace the wrong way for your body and you're not going to have a good result. Check out this research. The American Journal of Physiology and Endocrinology published something that indicated that when you are overweight and you start uh, putting your body into some kind of stress, like whether it's mild exercise or fasting or anything like that, you end up having trouble getting fat adapted and oxidizing fat. What's interesting is overweight people, when they would exercise or fast or anything like that, they can still get fat adapted. So this is wild. They can still allow their cells to develop the ability to utilize fat, meaning they're upregulating something called PPAR alpha. So they can absolutely still upregulate the ability for the body to use fat, but there's something standing in the way. This thing that's standing in the way is called pyruvate dehydrogenase. And normally in a healthy individual that's fat adapted, when the body starts using fats during a fast, pyruvate dehydrogenase downregulates. 
pyruvate dehydrogenase is like the glucose gobbler, and it wants glucose. And if pyruvate dehydrogenase is continually elevated, it's going to continue to gobble glucose, even though you're perfectly capable of using fats. This is what's intriguing. So what happens is, when you are a beginner and you start on a prolonged fast, even though you want, with every fiber of your physiological being, to utilize fat, what's happening is your body is using glucose. And it's trying to use glucose, when in reality, you'd feel so much better if you use fat. What does this do? Well, it commands that your body takes more glucose from the muscle tissue via gluconeogenesis. So you break down muscle. It commands that you have more glucose needed for the brain, which sends you on a blood sugar roller coaster ride. It makes it for an unpleasant and, quite frankly, poor result experience. So you need to find a way to work yourself up. One of the quickest ways to work yourself up is to do like three days a week of 14, 16 hour fasts and work your way up for a month and then embark on a prolonged fast. It's not because I don't want you jumping right into the fire. Okay, I want you to get results, but I don't want you to completely sabotage your results in the long term just because you're eager. This next mistake is a huge one, and relatively new research as well, and that is a micronutrient deficiency that can happen if you're doing a prolonged fast. During your prolonged fast, sure, it's normal, you're not consuming nutrients, okay, but what ends up happening is if you get consistent about prolonged fasting, you do it too much, you start developing a micronutrient deficiency, and that can be a problem, mainly in water-soluble vitamins, but the research is very clear with heart rate variability and vitamin B12. So this was published in the journal Autonomic Neuroscience, and it demonstrated that when you are deficient in vitamin B12, you end up having a pretty significant impairment of your heart rate variability, meaning you get more stressed out and you're going to get less out of the fast. Now, how do you restore this? Okay, well, this really comes to be a problem for people that are vegan or vegetarian, because it's hard for them to replenish true vitamin B12 without supplementation. But the fact is, whether you are vegan or vegetarian or not, still about 15% of the population are deficient in vitamin B12. And when you're fasting, I would bet you that that number goes up, because when you're fasting, water-soluble vitamins get excreted because the kidneys force the expelling of extra water. So you need to add some vitamin B12 if you're not getting it from your diet. Okay, It's going to be very important to get continued results with your fast. Which leads me into another thing that has to do with drinking too much water. So this next mistake is drinking too much water and diluting your mineral balance, particularly magnesium, during a longer fast. Wild new research. This new research comes at the International Journal of Physiology, Pathophysiology, and Pharmacology. Okay, it found that magnesium levels really do help out fatty acid oxidation as far as PPR alpha activation goes. Let me explain what that means. Magnesium is what is called a cofactor in the phosphorylation of proteins that are required to get you fat adapted. Remember, being fat adapted is the goal with fasting. Get your body so used to using fats that it becomes a fat burning machine, right? Well, magnesium is a required cofactor for that protein activation. So they found that when magnesium levels are sufficient, you had a higher level of PPAR activation in the muscle, which is what we want, and better insulin sensitivity. Now, this is done in mice, but it's still very similar, and it could quite candidly be applied. Okay, so, well, that's great. So should we take a bunch of magnesium during a fast? Well, you probably sh would get a benefit out of it, if you ask me, but that's purely anecdotal. Okay, I love magnesium during a fast. The bigger problem is about becoming deficient. It's not necessarily this dose-dependent thing where you add more magnesium equals more fat adaptation, but it definitely does equate to less magnesium equals less fat adaptation. And during a fast, once again, what happens? Kidneys expel extra water because of low insulin levels. Magnesium just so happens to be a mineral that you lose a lot of. Your body does a halfway decent job of maintaining sodium balance because it's so critical, so your blood electrolyte levels will you know, balance out a little bit, but magnesium is very critical, but it's not as vital to survival, so your body will expel it a little bit. This becomes a problem because then you lose your ability to become fat adapted as magnesium levels deplete. So yes, supplementing magnesium, but even more importantly, is not oversaturating your body with water. I understand that drinking water is going to make it so that you're satiated. I get it, and it solves the boredom equation, but if you're going to drink water, you need to be adding electrolytes to it. I usually recommend element electrolytes. Uh, I can throw a link down below for those as well. The next and final one is going to be fasting when you are not up to anything, when you're bored. It sounds so counterintuitive to everything else I've talked about. Like, I thought I should be fasting when I'm just sitting around not stressed out at all. There's a fine line between being stressed out and being like active, doing something. You should be doing something. The boredom will drive you nuts and it will cause you to do things that you shouldn't do. Like, oh, I'm just going to sip on some extra water. Or, oh, I'm going to take in some extra coffee just because I'm bored and I want to get more energy. If you're actually active, that's the best way. Okay, 
You're going to Disneyland, you're walking around, doing something. You're gonna go to work, you're busy, okay? You're traveling, where you're moving around, you're doing stuff. It keeps your mind occupied, which keeps you sane, and that's probably the biggest piece of the puzzle. So that's your brain, what good is your body? I'll see you tomorrow.